floor is on. Um, the document which is on your on your chairs, which is a, 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 docu a draft document, it's a, it's a draft Council of Europe guide on human rights for um, Just a few words on, on the Council of Europe to begin with to, to put this into context. The Council of Europe is a some of the, you will know it's a, it's a, it's a governmental organisation in, in Europe and it has supported a several observers. Uh, you probably know that it has also some of the EU binding conventions, um, the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, but also other conventions like the Cyber Crime Convention and the Convention 108 on, on the protection of personal data. Um, and these are also signed by countries outside of Europe. So with that said, um, Catholic Europe is trying is very much involved in multi-stakeholder dialogue. So Although at the end of the process, member states sit down and adopt and agree the contents, uh, we are really building up a process of dialogue. And I include this document in this uh, dialogue with other actors, um, private sector, civil society, other communities, both in and outside of Europe. So we really appreciate this in the governance forum because it allows us to come uh, out of uh, the walls of, of, of Europe and to uh, to, to consult with other actors in other parts of the world. Why that's important is because um, I, I, the word Europe, is, this work is, it, it might have a beginning in Europe, but I very much hope it, it, it doesn't have an end in Europe. I think it's a piece of work which we're going to go to discuss, which I think is very useful um, uh, from many other parts of the world. We talk a lot about human rights in the Governance Forum. It's, um, since its inception, it's been a lot about human rights. Um, and, and in this particular government forum in Bali, uh, its, its development was, was a lot about human rights and its, uh, what it was supposed to deliver. Um, Bruce Schneier said in his, in his comments to the, one of the documents of the IG, in the IGF Delegate Act, that he was concerned about everybody in the middle uh, with regard to you know, the internet. And he talked about um, that he, I'll just say, he says, my main concern is for the rest of us, everyone in the middle. These are the people who don't have the technical ability to evade either the large governments and corporations that are controlling our internet use, or the criminal hacker groups who prey on us. These are people who accept the default configuration options, arbitrary terms of service, etc. So the reason why I point that out is because um, uh, we talk about human rights from, that, uh, from a high level point of view, but do we really understand what the user Understands regarding their human rights. Do they understand in, in, in practice uh, uh, that they have the right to privacy or the right to freedom of expression, or the right to assembly and association, for example? Do they know what they mean in terms of actually when they're on the internet and actually doing it? So the, the objective of this work um, was to have started in Europe was to um, to, to help uh, people to. Um, to understand, to, to be, uh, to have their awareness raised about the fact that they have human rights and life, first of all. Second of all, that they have information, that they have that right and that they can do things. And thirdly, that they can do things, they can act upon their rights. So uh, the, that, that's the basic uh, aim. And it's, it's a, this work is not about um, creating new human rights. It's not about creating new mechanisms. It's about simply um, understanding what existing rights mean in a, in a practical context and about trying to understand that there are existing mechanisms, national mechanisms, which can help users uh, act upon their rights. Ombuds persons, information commissioners, etc. You know, to try to join the dots between them. So that, that's, the, that's the really the basis. And um, you have the documents on your, on your chairs, your desks. So you have the draft guide and you have the, the Internet Governance Strategy of the Council of Europe. Um, so this, this this draft guide it looks it's it's a it's, it's drafted in very simple language for users um, on purpose because we really want to convey the simplicity of what a human right is online and um, this this is a chance to have a consultation we started the consultation on this draft now this week and it runs until the fifteenth of November so you have the chance now and later to send us comments. Um, 
and I'll give you the email address later to send us comments, um, written comments, and we're, and we're going to try to build that, those, those comments into the process. Um, and we're really try, going to try to uh, reflect the feedback and come out with a, with a draft text which has been commented on. And then thereafter, we're going to put it back into the governmental procedures of the Council of Europe in December for discussion with member states and with observers. And, and that means observers means uh, uh, ISARC and others, and OSCE, UNESCO, uh, and, and plenty of other observers to discuss uh, this draft guide on human rights for internet users. Um, it was drafted by a, um, a mixed group of governmental and independent experts. So there were seven governmental experts and six independent experts, which just shows you how uh, multi-stakeholder it, it is in terms of its uh, preparation. I'm very proud of that fact that we have some of them with us today, and they're going to be um, our uh, panelists. Uh, some of others are to come in the room a little bit later. Um, I'd like to um, introduce you to two of them. So just to here, here to my left, we have Dixie Fortin um, from Global Partners Digital. And you're one of the uh, independent experts. Um, and so, and to my, uh, maybe I, I don't know the, the precise way of your affiliation. Could you tell me what your affiliation is? Um, yeah, I'm sure that they have many hands. Uh, actually, I was uh, both a uh, representative of uh, an NGO, European Digital Rights, which is uh, an association of uh, uh, almost 30 uh, European, uh, national European organizations, and also in my academic capacity as a DNA researcher. Okay, thank you. And I hope that we're going to have Johan Hannenburg, who is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, also to come in because he was also uh, alongside Marian and Dixie. A governmental expert who, who was part of the process over the last 12 months in drafting this text. So, um, and then just to, just to conclude by saying in this first part is that we have also Matthias Tramer to my right, who is from the Austrian government, from the Federal Chancellery. And uh, Matthias is a, a, a member of the steering committee, which is going to receive his documents um, in December uh, with the feedback, and he's going to uh, himself. And, and, and the other member states are going to sit down and discuss this text and perhaps revise it and perhaps uh, uh, rework it and to, to hopefully finish and complete that process and then send it to its final stages, which is to the executive organ to decide and hopefully adopt the text. So it has to be on intergovernmental things, but still. So we are, uh, we, the idea is that this text will be, will be uh, finalized and hopefully with a view to adoption in the first quarter of and that's the that's the end of the beginning, hopefully this this draft. But but it, it, I, again, I just stress the point that the word Europe is not just about Europe. It starts it starts in Europe, and I very much hope this will have value and utility for, for people outside of Europe because it could be a it could be a baseline for others, and it could be replicated, for example, um, the IRP coalition charter, for example. We have now Matthias Lewin from that from the IRP charter. I mean, they have a, a, a complementary process regarding their charter, which. Has, I think it's very important to, um, to stress, and, uh, and, and you know, it's going to help each other if these things are going to be worked out in that way. So, without further, further ado, I'd like, to, um, I'd like to take you to the text, to the draft guide. Um, and, and I, the idea is that we, that we look at this guide, um, we have a discussion about some of the elements. Um, I'd like your general feedback, your specific feedback, if possible. Um, as I said, it's been a 12 months in the, in the drafting and the making, um, and it's been a, it's a great, great challenge to try to understand the human rights, and it's been based upon the European Convention on Human Rights and certain other kind of European Union conventions and other standards. Um, it, it, this work is not invented from people's heads. This is based upon previously adopted standards, so it's very, very measured and worked out. And the challenge has been the challenge has been in making the text simple for users to understand. Um, a few words about what the web to navigate you through this is that you have a you know, general introduction followed by some overarching uh, uh, principles regarding access to, to the internet and non-discrimination. Um, there's, there's a chapter on freedom of expression and information, assembly, association, and participation. Of course, privacy and data protection. 
uh, education and literacy, children and young people, and another overarching element, which is the effective remedies part, which is very important, um, because without effective remedies, what, you know, what rights and freedoms do you have? Um, and so that's where we are. I'd like, I'd like to, to start discussing it with you. I don't want to talk much more. Um, I'd like to pass to, to Miriam and to, to Dick Stitch to begin with, and to others, um, and ask you to maybe pull out some of the, the most uh, interesting elements you, you found in the process that you want to you want to convey to, to the room and to remote participation. If there are any, please stick up to me for me. And hello to everybody online. Um, should we start with Mary? Do you want to start with your some of the maybe the points you want to put in the topic? Why don't we we work through your bits? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scott, because uh, I have to apologize in advance. I will have to leave at uh, at noon to catch my uh, my my flight. So, um, as as uh, first of all, let's welcome uh, the co-chair, the vice chair of our <laughs> committee of experts, Thomas Schneider. From uh, Switzerland, uh, representing uh, the government. Um, yeah, actually, I, I will start by by the end, by the effective remedies, because uh, as Lee said, without effective remedies, there are no uh, real rights, and uh, uh, we have uh, many uh, declarations uh, by uh, uh, many people, or group of people, different stakeholders and uh, they uh, remain uh, like wishful uh, thinking without uh, effective remedies and means of uh, redress. So this is, I think, one of the main added value of uh, this guide. Um, so we, we tried in this section to um, addressing the, the, the user to uh, tell him which kind of uh, remedies one first think of uh, uh, filing a complaint with, uh, with the court, but we know this is a long process, this is a costly process, and uh, this is a process that the average user uh, would probably not undertake unless the issue is very serious. So we need to show the user that there are also other uh, remedies, just like we have uh, hard law with legislation, but we can also rely on soft law instruments. So we have identified a, a set of uh, uh, different uh, remedies, uh, categories of uh, remedies, which uh, could be, of course, depending on the, uh, vi uh, the, the kind of uh, violation of, uh, of the right. It could be simply uh, an inquiry or, or request for, for explanation, for instance, uh, for asking the internet service provider um, some explanation about uh, some right infringement. It could be, as you can see, a uh, reply, and what we meant here is a reference to a uh, recommendation of the Council of Europe on the right of reply on the internet, which in most of the cases, I think, could be a very useful means of uh, redress uh, in case of uh, uh, defamation or, 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 or insult, uh, there is also there are also requests for correcting some some uh, some content if there are if there are mistakes. Uh, requests for apology. We have to see. I'm not sure uh, to which extent one can get apologies on, on the internet. But we also have mentioned reinstatement and reconnection in case. Uh, the someone has been uh, disconnected from uh, from from the internet, and also some uh, compensation. Then we give some uh, inputs on what these kind of remedies could mean in uh, in practice to whom you whom you should uh, address to obtain uh, this uh, this kind of remedy. We also mention because the, that could be useful at the national level. We uh, mention um, the 
guidance that could be obtained and more information from public authorities at each uh, national level and also including uh, national human rights institutions like ombudsperson for instance, data protection authorities of course in the case of uh, privacy violation and also citizens uh, advice office uh, as well as uh, human rights and digital rights associations and consumer organizations who are there to help also the, 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 the end uh, users. We have put in this section because we have had a lot of discussion on uh, whether we should address cybercrime issues and uh, especially the kind of issues related to identity theft and other fraudulent manipulation and then instead of having one section uh, in itself, we have uh, uh, included uh, here in the effective remedies, so uh, uh, the, that the user can expect remedies um, when it is confronted to such uh, intrusions, illegal uh, access, or even uh, identity theft, as I said. And finally, we have uh, put in this uh, section as well uh, the uh, provision the, that we find in, uh, uh, of course, in the European Convention on Human Rights, but also in the, in the Declaration, in the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights and uh, the Covenants, etc., uh, we uh, have introduced and well, reminded uh, the user that uh, uh, each one has uh, the right to a fair trial uh, in case. Uh, person is facing uh, any criminal charge against uh, him or her, uh, in this case, uh, so there is a, the right to a fair trial, and uh, uh, in the end, we remind that there is also uh, the possibility to uh, uh, file a, a complaint with the European Court of Human Rights, but of course, after having exhausted all the available uh, domestic uh, uh, so uh, this is for the effective remedy section. Uh, maybe uh, we could get back to other substantive session. I don't know, Lee. Yeah, well, let's just stop there for a second. Thank yeah. you, Mary. That's very, very important. This, this section is very important. Effective remedies are very important. Um, I want to know whether you think you have any comments. I mean, you know, in your in your opinion, uh, in the countries that you live, do you feel that you do you have do you know that you have the right to an effective remedy? Do you know that you can go and approach an existing body which should be able to take that claim, that complaint, and do something with it to make you? Are you aware of that um, or, or not? Do you, um, and what, which, which bodies are we talking about? I mean, the, the, the essence of this text is to try to make people aware and to act upon the rights. And so, connecting existing rights to existing institutions, are we doing enough? And will this guide help people in your countries to, to do that? And yeah, the, the floor is open. Um, this may be not quite the moment, but it occurred to me with effective remedies, uh, there's, there's a middle level that we sometimes miss, and it's actually educating management uh, about about this guy and what they can do, because they are making decisions without understanding. I've just had an email from my senior management at my university who recently signed up to the cloud with a large uh, American corporation. There's huge problems and issues about the data retention policy since the prison uh, scandal has broken even more. But the management have no idea about these issues we're talking about today. They're busy, they've got cost-cutting issues. So in terms of remedies, if our managements don't understand where to go and what to do, so can we also include in the remedies, uh, not remedies, but also prevention? What is it, 90% of the cure? Can we, I don't know if there's any ideas about that, and if I'm off the agenda point, my apologies. Can we return to this point as a better moment? Thank you. Thank you very much, I mean, the fact that you eventually sort of hinted at in the second sentence, which is to obtain a remedy, you shouldn't necessarily have to pursue legal action straight away. And that other recourse, other, other avenues for a great red mess. But the point, anyone want to comment on effective remedies? Anyone want to, uh, you, hopefully you've read the, the section there to read, it's on that, it's in the, in the guide towards the end. Any comments on this? Um, yeah, Fish. Uh, I've got one comment at a very high level, which I've no doubt you went round and round many times. Uh, I think I heard Marie say that uh, maybe 
uh, we really want your comments, we really want to make this as strong a text it's, it's, it's really trying to be enriched by you, and, and we really want it to resonate with you, so that it links with, with you, and that you want to take it further. So I'm, I hear often about the practical uh, difficulties when, when, when drafting the text, which all in all is uh, much um, endorsed by me and by us, and will be endorsed by my government. But especially the point uh, as regards to effective remedies, and see from a lawyer's point of view, which I am, um, this really shows one of the difficulties I think the group had just beginning, what is the right, and moreover, what is desired, even. And uh, effective remedies, I have a little bit of a problem when you take um, a term which is absolutely stated in the European Convention on Human Rights under Article 13. It means something very special, that finally you must have a guarantee by the member state that you can go to an authority or a court. Um, with a certain quality. This is also in the Convention on Human Rights. Um, so, when, when I read the text here under effective remedies, it's very fine, the first sentence, but when you say, to obtain a remedy, you should necessarily have to pursue legal action, that's also fine, but two sentences more, you say effective remedies can also include explanation, reply, correction, apology, and so on. This is not the re effective remedy term that we have in the Convention on Human Rights. I mean, what I think, and what I really strongly would propose here, is to say what is the effective remedy in the way that the state finally has a positive obligation if the private companies don't do anything. For example, you have a court case, finally, and you would have, as a judge, to decide how did this private network operator behave? Um, did he, for example, uh, use due diligence when he was offering his service and so? Did he get in contact with the customer who, who, who looked for help and so on? And finally, as the judge, then I would decide the entire behavior of this company and would say, well, this was in line or was not in line with uh, the legal basis. So, uh, just this hint on, on effective remedies, I think it's one of the most important parts, but don't confuse people in the way that you use legal terms from the convention and say that it's the same as, for example, a helpline, uh, which is, of course, necessary. So, maybe you can make a little slight difference in the wording. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. It's very good comments, and uh, I won't... Uh, Take a note of an email email address because I'd like to send your comments in to us if possible. I, IG at coe dot int. I'll repeat it regularly throughout this session. Um, I'd like to bring in Mary, but before we do that, the gentleman the gentleman over here uh, who's writing, um, he, you seem to be confused. I don't know whether you want to come in on this point regarding. Um, uh, yeah, you were shaking your head, and I, I just wanted to I wanted to get your feedback, please, if you if to, to tell us what you think, if you agree. Yes, yes. I'm Bartolomeo Pufi uh, from Beautiful Exchange of Understanding, and I am also a member of the Advisory Council on Youth of the Council of Europe. That um, shaking head, uh, it's simple because besides the policy making, which I think that this document, I mean, besides it's well done, but should also, let's say, give more explanation in terms of the background since it's a guide. I would like to underline the fact that um, as Council of Europe and the Youth Department, we have run the campaign of knowledge speech movement, which for people that pass by Strasbourg, it's very easy to see because all the buildings are with, uh, are with this campaign. Uh, why I'm underlining this? Last year in the IGF, there was a colleague from the Department present. I don't know why he's here. I mean, he's not, but for the importance of the role of the education, that, that, that education has among the young people. No, so, I mean, it's important that the policy, eh, I don't know if we speak about the document, but also what are the actions in terms of education that the member states 
are taking and we had just last just uh, one week two weeks ago we had our joint council and there is also the um, commitment of the member states that decided to extend the campaign until 2015 so there is already a commitment from the youth department to the member states to the promotion anti-discrimination online so basically it could be cross-sectoral in terms of cooperation sometimes you are aware that in terms of it's not always easy but could i think that uh, especially with the educational department youth department Um, uh, we have Mary and Thomas, you want to speak? Uh, yeah, just uh, I, I wanted to quickly um, answer Matthias' point. First of all, thank you very much because this is very important. I think you have got a real point here. And uh, probably we should uh, replace this uh, by relevant remedies or useful or practical remedies or something like that. Uh, now, it's just because I have to, to leave in uh, five minutes. Do you want the presentation on access and non discrimination or before you leave, I think we, if, you, if you could before you leave that'd be good. And we'll come back to uh, yeah. Thomas if you don't mind so that Mary can speak. Uh, okay Thomas. Yeah, I will try to, to be quick. So uh, our our first section is uh, about access and non discrimination. As Thomas said we had a lot of uh, discussion and debate uh, on whether we should uh, introduce uh, a right uh, to to access and then we decided not to because that was our mandate because some governments present in the group didn't want um, to have this mentioned for a very simple uh, reason and I agree very much on, on this because uh, just uh, claiming a right to access, even at the constitutional level, is very nice. But what we need is real public policy and money to, uh, uh, to, to, to make this uh, right of uh, access real. So uh, we prefer to uh, talk about uh, non-discrimination mainly. Uh, so we, we addressed some uh, what we refer to in general as the internet principles like network neutrality and uh, by uh, saying that uh, there, there should be uh, non-discriminatory uh, dis uh, access and affordable uh, access uh, and we were uh, quite precise in mentioning the greatest possible access to content, application and services using the devices of, uh, your of your choice. Also, we made it clear that uh, any user should not be disconnected from the Internet against his or her, her will, except when it is decided by a court. And here there is a clear reference to Adobe like law and other cases. Uh, uh, strike law. So we have taken the same route, uh, I would say, as the uh, UN rapporteur on freedom of expression, uh, uh, Frank Larue, he, in his uh, uh, report on this. He is not claiming in his report a right to access, but a kind of freedom to access, acknowledging that to realize your human rights on the internet, of course, the prerequisite is that you have access. Then we uh, have also, uh, uh, we address public authorities, be the uh, national, regional, or even local public authorities, uh, in view uh, to remind them that they should facilitate uh, the uh, access to the internet for people living in, uh, let's say, in rural uh, areas. Uh, and also for um, for the poor, so, so there should be some kind of affirmative action, I would say, and some specific policies so that these people can have uh, access as much as uh, the people living in big cities. Uh, also, there is a mention of a special uh, um, measure uh, needed uh, for um, low income, as, as I said, or also people with special needs and. Uh, among them uh, disabled people. And finally, we address in this section the principle of non-discrimination uh, as uh, set forth in uh, international human rights standards and also in the European Convention, of course, uh, so that 
the access of a person uh, shouldn't be discriminated against any ground. And we list this kind of ground, which are sex, male or female, race, color, language, religion, or belief, or absence of religion, that's what we mean, uh, on any political or other opinion, uh, national or social origin, association with a national minority, property, birth or other status, including ethnicity, age or sexual orientation. I have listed all this kind of possible discrimination ground uh, because I think this is very important and this is very important that they are mentioned here in this guide for more internet users. Thank you. And uh, uh, since I have to go, I would like to say goodbye to everyone and sorry that I can't stay more with you. Thank you, Mariam. Um, we, uh, we, we have Thomas who wants to take the floor, and uh, Luca. Thank you. Before you leave, Mariam, I wanted to say goodbye. Thank you for all the good work that you did for the group. Um, just a quick remark to, 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 to um, I agree with everything that Mariam said uh, right now. A quick remark to what uh, Matthias has said about the effective remedies. Um, the problem is, uh, one of the challenges with this text is that we have to uh, basically do the margin walk between legally, between being legally correct and, and what we think or hope understandable by an average user. But I see the point about what effective remedies, the word, the expression implies from a legal point of view uh, based on, on, on the convention. So if you might add a sentence there, because we could say in the, con there is the, in the convention this means court, and, but you don't, and if you have ideas of completely rephrasing it or changing the word effect remedies to something else in a particular situation, then of course we will be happy. Um, Matt, do you want to respond to Matt? No, no, just direct there. Uh, I know this is really uh, a challenge to make it understandable. What I just wanted to say, even if you make something understandable, you shouldn't use uh, legal terms in a, in a, a sorry to say, fluffy mode. Um, and, 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 and secondly, what should be explained to the user, be it in the main text or in the memorandum, is that finally there is a, a responsibility of the state. Finally, yes. Even if it's just a relation between privates, first of all, you try to get an agreement with the private company and so. But finally, it's always the question: Are your human rights to sometimes infringed? And finally, it's the state that has to, be, or you have a right that the state decides about. It. Thank you. Well, the question is: Is, the, is this draft guide? So I repeat, it's a draft for your comments. Is it, is it raising, raising the right and, and, and accurate awareness of the risk? Is it really giving the user the right information? Is it really explaining to them? I really have, would, would like your comments on that. Um, I'd like to go to Luca, but if that's not directly... Uh, do you have a comment, Mario? Thank you. After Luca, okay, Luca, please. Thank you. So, uh, as a couple of speakers were speaking about net neutrality, I would like also to mention an initiative that has been started by the Council of Europe and developed by the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality, a model framework on how to protect net neutrality in an efficient fashion in, consist in consistency with uh, human rights standards and obviously with the European Convention on Human Rights. The framework uh, has been presented uh, one hour ago, two hours ago, sorry, uh, at the Dynamic Coalition meeting. It is uh, uh, a framework that not only defines what is net neutrality and the limits, but also how to implement it, so who should implement it and how, uh, defines uh, several things. If you, have, if you have the time, you can read the, this report. Unfortunately, I, I just have two copies left because it was quite successful, but you can find it online at uh, netneutrality.info. Uh, it's in uh, CC by license. The, the model framework is also in a uh, report that uh, has been drafted uh, for the Council of Europe because I, this, this standard has been uh, suggested and proposed, stimulated by the Council of Europe, 
and will uh, end up at the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers in a couple of weeks, so that can be considered and uh, perhaps uh, hopefully uh, recommended. I think it's a, a brilliant start. I think uh, it's certainly clearer. It, it uh, perhaps needs precision. I think it's a question of which users. If you're really targeting everyday users, like people who don't necessarily understand, you know, law, but want their stuff to work properly, then I think um, this is a really good start. But of course, it's about formatting and also anchoring it in. If they live in this country, where do they go? If they live in this country, where do they go? And that starts to create a long tail. I know. But that long tail is important. Um, yeah, just a question of design. And the content, of course, is like, um, I've just read, your employer must inform you of any surveillance and or monitoring they carry out. And then we have, and if they do not inform you, this is about the remedies, where, what can you do next? Because most of us with employers who make these decisions don't have much recourse once the decision is made. The migration is happening on your desktop, you know, you find out that so on and so forth. And how can you do this in such a way that you're not exposed as an individual? So you really have to drill down into, eventually as the document builds, without making it top heavy, a long tail and a nice head. I don't know, does that but make sense? Thank you very much. We, we, we discussed it at length too, that, that there was a choice made about the length and about, this, about the, um, the simplicity. Uh, uh, very quickly, one can get into a very, very long document with lots and lots of pages, which no longer becomes useful for the user because it's a navigated, it's very difficult, and then it becomes a, a much more exhaustive compendium. There was a decision made to make it short and simple to read, very easy to access and to act upon. So, so far, there's been a choice made regarding what to include, what not to include. It's, it is selective, it's selective in its choice of the rights to be considered, and it's not exhaustive at all. So, I mean, in the sense it can, it's a, it's open, it could be open to periodic review, it can evolve, uh, I hope it will evolve. Uh, and um, you know the short head, long tail. It's a very good point, but how much information is it, how much information is good for the user? First of all, um, Tom, do you want to come in on this point? Because I really I want to go to Shankar. Okay, quickly. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. I think uh, Marion uh, raised a, a very essential point, and um, of course, it's a question of how much space do we have in this format. And the idea is my ideas and I hope they will have the resources of the council here to do it that this is not the paper, it's not the end of this but it's actually the first entry page of a website where you can click on every issue and find the respective uh, human rights article the respective court cases and ideally but that's probably not so easy you can type in in which country you live and then you get the remedies or the situation in your country, that would be nice I don't know whether they can go that far, but for sure the rest should be part of an interactive website where you can choose your level of, of information, of depth, uh, and specificity, specificity to uh, a situation. But we might add a sentence, which I think is not there yet, about, especially with the remedies, about differences between national legislation. This is something that we might at least hint at. Thank you. Jack Hong from UNESCO, please. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, everyone. Uh, particularly, I uh, very much appreciate this great uh, initiative to do a tailored version for the users on human rights. Uh, I think this approach is quite renovative uh, in the internet uh, uh, context. Uh, we didn't do any sort of thing for TV users, for radio users, but we do it for internet users because it is an issue. And, uh, I just wonder that uh, is it uh, for your, for users in Europe uh, or you do this for general? It must have come in late because we, it, it's it's um it will it starts in Europe. I mean it's going to be um, adopted. It's, it has a multi-stakeholder uh, Europe and non-European uh, outreach discussion. Now we're in discussions. It's a consultation process which starts this week in the IGF and runs until the 15th. Okay. And you can send your comments in by in writing, and we will try to include them in the, in the, in the revision of the text. And then thereafter, it will go to uh, the member states, the 47 member states, and other uh, observers, including non-state actors, 
to discuss with Matthias, uh, Matthias Tremer from Austria and Thomas Schneider from, from um, Switzerland and others to discuss this draft revised and further revisions to make sure we get the selection, the balance, the information of all right. Um, that's the key to the next I think thank you for this concept. Then I, I want to continue to, uh, to comment this because, um, uh, you know, in UNESCO we have the, so we also uh, promote the awareness, literacy on the human rights of expression. And uh, to my point of view, this is too short, uh, too, <laughs> too, too simple. Too, there are too many things which should be more elabor elaborated because maybe in Europe that the user has a higher level of literacy of those human rights issues. But uh, to my understanding, for example, we had a project on the freedom, just to talk about the free expression uh, issues. <coughs> we got the 100 page uh, toolkit on that to, to teach. Uh, people, including youth, so what, what free expression is, what should be done, what, is, what are limitations with some cases. It's not an easy job uh, to, they are not like uh, everyone here, you know everything, you found everything, it's apparent. But for the um, normal users, not to mention those uh, farmers, workers, and, uh, they are all, all use mobiles. And so I think that uh, uh, yeah, for policy makers, yeah, we know it, but uh, for, for the common users, I think it's uh, far from being understandable. And there's just a few uh, aspects to share. That if we do something like this, that we will have more aspects, uh, uh, on the, some aspects on the safety and the security issues as well. I saw it in the children and the young people, but it's my understanding that many adults also they are quite uh, uh, less aware of that. And uh, on the education and literacy issue, the item, uh, I, I, I like to also to have a la language multilingualism component there. Uh, and, and even Europe is also quite uh, diverse in language, not only uh, in terms of access, uh, domain name, uh, the URL, but also the content. And uh, for, the, for the remedies, um, it's a very interesting part. When I read it, I just wonder that uh, any follow-up on all the uh, conditions we will go to create for that, because, uh, uh, because it, it's not so feasible. If I am a user, I'm really uh, very, very in a very uncomfortable position in the internet. Uh, if my Gmail is hacked, or uh, but I, how can I contact Google to do anything for me? And, uh, and we, I also encountered some, some, yeah, some attacks. Then uh, the ISP cannot just help uh, in, in general. And then if I, I also report to the French police, I live in Paris, and the, the police said, ah, oh, we cannot help either. We don't have this uh, capacity. We, so basically, we are helpless. So it, 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 yeah, it's beautiful to write in this way to listen to every can claim I have right, but in reality, it is really far from being possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a, a very good point. And uh, look at my remote moderators in case they have comments for me. I can't see you, but you can come in if you if there are any comments. Okay. Um, it's an entry point document. Uh, it, it covers everything at all levels. It will be a much bigger document. What's, it, what's enough of an entry level for a user to get excited? Well, excited is a big word. Interested in the fact that they're doing something and they can do something regarding that right. They have a right. They can do something. Uh, the additional information, the website that Thomas talked about, uh, the, uh, the national mechanisms need to be, you know, need to be understood. So they need to be, the information needs to be communicated. Um, there's many things which need to, clouds of things which need to be around this text, whichever length the detail it, it will be, uh, which we need to sort of think about as next steps. So first things first, I think it's a very important point. In the effectiveness of the, of, the, of, the, of the guide with regard to member states is very important, but not just member states. Um, now, you please, because we, you're not a part of it, you, I, I, we, I don't know you, and uh, I hope you've got some very interesting, fresh comments to make regarding this text, please. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Easton, I'm a, a legal academic researcher in the UK. Um, my specific work looks at accessibility and discrimination, disability discrimination statutes applying to the internet, and this suggestion may not 
really be um, relevant to what we're doing here if you're aiming this at the end user. But one thing I thought about looking at this and you're talking about effective remedies was the notion of using a document as a kind of steering document to be in a regulatory sense, in a softer sense. And I'll give you some examples in that basically with the disability discrimination statutes that exist in the US and the UK that I look at applying to the internet, um, quite often even the websites of public bodies are not as accessible as they should be. And there seems to be a theme um, across the EU and across the member states as well of focusing upon the public sector to try and actually tangibly bring about change. Because what I'm fascinated by is the difference, the gap between the substance of the legal provisions and the actual reality. Now, I'm specifically looking at accessibility, but this could apply to things such as data protection as well. Um, so in the UK, we have a um, disability equality duty, which applies to public sector agencies, so the public, um, public bodies, public agencies. And what it really is trying to do is not so much create new duties, but just to say you should be a beacon of best practice here. You should be steering the, um, the actual tangible change, and you should be showing others how this should actually come about in reality. And what then happens, what, what I would argue, is there's a trickle-down effect because it impacts upon the procurement policies of those state agencies and how they actually deal with private companies who then perhaps provide um, data protection solutions, um, accessible websites and, and you know, other similar issues. So I just wondered whether you discussed something such as this. I mean, what I wouldn't say is to have extra duties placed on public bodies, but just to have certain statements that say, okay, these, these are the rights, but actually as signature parties to certain conventions, you as a, a nation state should be actually showing others how to act, how to make these rights actually a reality. And I don't know whether you might have discussed that in your... I think it's a very good point, and uh, um, in particular to certain countries, and you're saying in the UK. Um, just before we go there, um, I mean, if we can even find some words which actually, uh, at an entry level, you know, encourage this, this, this practice in this text, that's something to think about if you've got comments again on the position of comments. You know, if it's to be effective, it's going to, it's going to resonate with different stakeholders, groups, and users, and also governments and other authorities that you're referring to. They have to find themselves in that place somehow, somewhere, uh, for users. So if we, it, not just a few words, and the rest can be explained in another document, but please. Um, does somebody want to come to, to, um, to respond to that, um, Dixie, or others? I'm thinking, you know, it's putting an enormous amount of responsibility on so-called end users to know, you know, to sort of figure this all out. So I know it's important for us the same thing with the charter, uh, the IRP charter. It's a question of, okay, what's the first step? And then once you make the first step, you start to realise how many more steps you have to make. So I mean, in that sense, I think take courage, and I would build out the website as far as you just. Thomas, I don't think that should stop short. But if the if you're in a, a school, if you're in a university, if you're working in a government department, if you're a secretary, you need to sort of have these end users in your head. Who are these people? They're still very abstract. You know, it's your secretary, it's your research assistant, it's your student, it's 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 your student who can't get into the building because there's not decent lift access. It's your student who's got dyslexia. You know, it's the, it's the international students that I have to deal with who come from very different levels of internet access and equipment. So know your rights, as that famous punk band used to say. Know your rights at the start, but then what? So I think we need to think and really visualise who these people are you're speaking to and their levels of use. So the government needs a certain language, um, the regulators need a certain language, but like I keep pressing on, I mean, I just, well, I'm missing it too. The management, the ones who make the decisions, decisions, the ones who decide whether they migrate to Microsoft 365 desktop, whether they go with Google. These decisions are being made now and they're huge investments. And once an institution is tied up, they're locked in. They cannot get out quickly. So I'm thinking maybe we need to get a little bit more imaginative at this chance we have. Um, do 
what accounts you have done very, very well, but if you want to be accessible, there are different formats, and go, 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 right to the very end, get the money. You can get the money better than we can, come on. Thank you very much. I think that uh, I would, uh, I mean, I, I put it to the government, particularly to know, uh, with regard to that point, that we really do need to make sure that this, you know, this really moves on forward, that it's just the beginning, and uh, there's a lot more to do at the national level, so uh, again, it's an entry point which needs to excite it. Um, very quickly, Thomas, because I'd like to pass to Dixie to come in with um, one or two of the things that she particularly likes, but or, or wants to talk about regarding the draft. Please. Just, just a quick re uh, reply about, about the, uh, the forerunning role of the public entity. This is a good point, but it's difficult to put this into text because, because you can't say, like, it is your right or you can expect that the public entity do it but, um, to, to the user, but we have, uh, this is only one text, we have the explanatory report, which is what the text is called, that goes to the Committee of Ministers with this text, and that will be also used or transformed into something that will be accessible to the user, and there, for instance, and also the text that goes to the Committee of Ministers, because there, there, are, there are bits and elements that are not here because they are not directly targeted to the user, but rather the policy uh, bodies, there, this might be a good place to, to, to put in, but they actually have a responsibility there, and larger than just the normal, fully shared point. Can you hear really quickly, that could then lead into a lot of quite in-depth resources as well, that could aid in the other the department's review decisions. Hi, George, do you want to come in on this point? I am a privacy data protection expert for years. Well, I don't know exactly what I said finally, but um, I've read it uh, two or three times. Uh, I can understand that it is uh, difficult to find the right level of amount of information and the content. I completely agree with that. Uh, so, uh, to escape from the problem of people being, uh, feeling that it's too, too small or a, 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 a mixture of daily things and exceptional situations, I don't know how we can manage, maybe by uh, giving more information, saying, well, making this difference between regular situations and, because, you know, also adults have to know that when they write something on internet, they are something that uh, not only the children, huh? <laughs> the adults. So th there is a need for more information, more maybe more uh, examples of uh, different situations, also best practice, you know. But not directly with it, you know. It could be behind a, a URL or something. Huh? That's being, that's being done because we yes. I didn't want to overload with information. And for privacy, uh, in my view, uh, hmm, it's a little short because you, you are right with online, you, you have to mix uh, confidentiality on, on, on the communication. Huh? What happened with freedom of expression, because here again you have that, and about all this personal data processing which don't, you don't see much. So all this is referred to, so it's a little short. I mean, I don't have, there is one example I don't agree, but I guess I can write to you, uh, because the, the term of reference, you know, if you take the, the American term of reference, uh, you agree to it so they can do anything they want, which is completely against the principle. So this, we have to find another example. I will, I will uh, make, uh, suggestions to you by, uh, by email. Uh, so I think it should be a little more complex. Also, I don't know, but um, under data protection, the data protection uh, authorities in Europe, uh, but not only, Canada, uh, even Burkina Faso, they made great things, you know, uh, like Dessin uh, Animé, uh, the Représentation Théâtrale, Huh? To, to figure out, because in Africa people don't read a lot, 
but half of the terms. So th they are making a, a theater. It's very good. It's very good. So um, how not to present Council of Europe doing something that nobody does? You know, what is the added value from what is already done at national level? How to make the connection with things that can be much more detailed? I quote, I, it is not a criticize. I quote, more uh, effective because, you know, more practical and so forth. That has been done. I don't know. Huh? Uh, because many, many references will be uh, not very interesting, I mean, too, too heavy. So it ha what you did has some uh, advantage, but well, in another way. Please, please give your comments because uh, I'm, 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 please criticize the text. This is weird. It's important that you criticize and you say what you're unhappy with. This is not about saying what's good about it only. I really wish we could make sure we could find out the criticism the difficulties because this is what we're here for. And uh, I'm very reassured that in general you understand and you generally perhaps understand the, the parameters with some reworking. That's reassuring because you are a, a privacy and data protection expert and that's reassuring. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're making progress. That's what, that, that's what matters. So, um, can I pass to... Um, this please, if that's okay. oh, have you finished? Okay. I'd like to add that if this is going to be used by teachers, by parents, with them, uh, there is some more background because it's, it's a, uh, with internet, suddenly everybody has to face things that they never thought about before, except if they were acting. Okay? So you have to, to give those background, uh, also on the philosophical, I would say. Uh, this is a criticism, I'm afraid it's of the process. Uh, I'm now rather discouraged from commenting on this because some of the comments that have been made have been answered by saying this is somewhere else. Uh, which is, without that somewhere else, without that, that other material, it's quite difficult, therefore, to motivate yourself to comment on it. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please, and then we're going to go to Marion. Well, I, I actually see it more, um, it shouldn't be more comprehensive than it is. Uh, 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 Your name, please, just sorry. My name is Ashraf Mikhail, I'm from the Danish Institute of Human Rights. And I think it's, it, it, it covers to all the Danish Institute of Rights. I'm just maybe more concerned of how this will be communicated to you, to the user. Even it's 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 very simple language. You can see but, uh, and how this uh, the, the, the communication aspect to the, the user, the end user, is maybe a bit difficult job. Um, and I maybe will refer to something where I'm talking about, like um, since we already um, do in, in, in the integration of human rights in in, in school curriculum. This is going to be actually um, part of in, 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 this, in this process. Um, so to, to be up to the national context, how actually to communicate this further to the to the end user, if the child or other. Um, uh, we have 
don't have that much time left. I would like to pass to Dixie um, to, uh, to to comment on one or two of the points. And there's a, we have someone for a remote. Should we take that very quickly and then we can pass to Dixie? Please. Yes, we have Oksana from Ukraine. Uh, his, his question is regarding monitoring mechanism on media and information society issues from the Council of Europe. What is the status of this initiative just now? Will it cover national AGFs, for example? Matt, just very quickly, so I don't have a response to that question. And then no, I don't have to respond, I just have my opinion. Uh, I, I, I say this, first of all, of course, it gets within the, it, it is an instrument, it will be an instrument uh, of the Council of Europe, so let's say, um, formally accepted, first of all, by the members of the Council of Europe. But the intention, as Lee has already pointed out, is uh, to present an instrument, a tool, that can be used by everybody. So that can be also used by, let's say, uh, in, in, in the global context, that's what we wish, yeah? That we say it's a reference document. Um, for people, and um, we, I think, I don't know how much uh, co uh, Council of Europe will then uh, stress his copyright, uh, but I think the Council of Europe will be very happy um, if this instrument is also some kind of best practice example um, in the context of making understandable to people um, the user's rights. So, uh, so, trying to answer this question, first of all, it will be a political uh, document, it will be a document which will be seconded and, and supported by member states. It will be a committee of ministers' decision. But the substance is such, and the tool is such, uh, and, and the meaning is to, uh, to offer an instrument to everybody who wants to make use of it. That's the way also the Council sees it, because I speak as a member state. Thank you, Matthias. I hope that responds to Oksana, so thank you for that comment. Um, Dixie, we're running into the last 10 minutes, so we're going to wrap up with comments from Matthias. Dixie, please. Um, I'd like to comment a little bit on the process. Um, when we started about a year ago, we didn't really have a fixed endpoint in mind, I guess, on, on what the document would look like. And it was becoming absolutely, it was getting longer and longer and longer and more complex and every little nuance and case study and example, um, you mentioned examples, that was actually one of our starting points that we all went out and tried to reach out to our networks at home and say what kind of um, human rights violations or interferences perhaps do you experience at the national level, what should, what should this guide be speaking to to be relevant for you. So we had all that in there as well. And yeah, it was extremely um, long and complex and, and very valuable for perhaps more academic uses or, or legal uses, but not to um, an average user, I'd say. And we made a decision, I can't remember when, I'm terrible with time, I'm guessing about six months ago or something, to go down the route of trying to have a very short, very user-friendly document. Um, we re really reassessed a lot of the language at that point. But we didn't want to lose all that extra work and all that extra detail because it was important. But the kind of route we wanted to take was the one Thomas was mentioning earlier. Of, of Yeah, this is going to be a, a hard document, but it should be digital. It should be online. And if it is online, then you have a possibility to um, share more information but in a way that the user is only directed to that which is relevant at the time so it becomes hopefully um, that information is there but it's not off-putting and it doesn't put someone off using the document. Um, and in terms of that second document and where that's at, um, I would be interested in hearing as well. Um, I mean we have a version that we looked at, but I'm, I'm, in terms of how that process relates to the process of finalizing this, there was a question that we had at the last session about whether we could spend a bit longer on that because we haven't had as much time to um, work, like finalize and, and, and clarify that as we have on this document. So that, that's an interesting point. 
Um, and okay, so Ali asked me to um, pick up on a point from within the charter that I thought was interesting and relevant and important. Um, the freedom of expression section to me is very close to my heart. Um, just because of the nature of the internet and the nature of its roles in our everyday communication, freedom of expression online is clearly something um, absolutely integral. And we do have violations of the Minister Council in Europe countries, and you can see that from even court cases at the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so that was the kind of section I wanted to kind of discuss briefly. Within that, we were trying to define the contours of that right, trying to give the user a sense of what that actually means. It doesn't necessarily mean you can just say absolutely anything, but that there are kind of protected areas of speech and other areas where there are permissible limitations. Um, we tried to give the user a sense of what the role of the public authority is worth in relation to that. We tried to give the users a sense around anonymity and um, pseudonymity and what kind of rights they'd have around that. But the bit which I find really interesting and really important is the bit about what the role of internet service providers and online service providers in particularly is in relation to freedom of expression. Um, from So I think the way that users experience the internet and if they're on something like Facebook or something, that feels like a, a public place to them. And that is a very important um, town square function for society. But at the same time, a lot, if not most, of the most popular online spaces are privately owned. And um, under the human rights instruments that exist, they do speak primarily to the state and to the roles and responsibilities of the state. Um, as Matthias was mentioning earlier, when they're talking about effective remedies, from a legal perspective, they're not actually talking about what the ISPs and online service providers should be doing. They're talking about the role of the state. And that's quite a difficult um, issue to get around in the internet space. And, and it's not just the internet space either. I mean, the way that the human rights uh, framework developed was, you know, when we were at the very start of globalization, before we had these massive transnational companies that had a lot of power, and so it did make sense to focus almost exclusively on the state. Since then, we have been, the human rights movement has been moving forward. They have been um, looking at what the roles and responsibilities of businesses are in relation to human rights. Um, you might have heard of the Ruggie Principles, which talks about the um, the respect, remedy, and oh, it's protect, respect, and remedy framework, which is trying to look at how businesses um, respond to human rights. And this really difficult issue to explain, it's an important issue to explain to users, and it's a difficult issue to explain to users. Because online spaces like potentially Facebook or many others can make their own rules to a certain extent about how they want to create that environment. It would be um, probably legitimate to have a space, for example, uh, if it's a, a women's rights website and you're having conversations about women's rights issues, if they wanted to delete comments which were maybe rude or um, unhelpful or if they were off topic, and that doesn't hit the language under human rights um, uh, documents like that might not be it might not constitute incitement to hatred or violence or, or discrimination but they would still be able to take that down as a private space and having the right to kind of create the space that they want um, and in many ways that's a very good thing because it means that on the internet there are all these sorts of different spaces that meet the needs of all different types of communities and so there's a lot of value in that and uh, having different types of spaces. But at the same time, there's a very thin line or a very, a very hard to recognize space from where that goes from a small community that's making a certain type of environment to where that might go to something like Facebook, which actually is um, 
a lot more powerful and that when they make restrictions that are more restrictive than freedom of expression can actually have a very big impact on how human rights are experienced by the user. And that's a very difficult issue that I know the Council of Europe has done a lot of work on. And I'm gonna wrap up. But I like, we started trying to look at how you could explain that to a user in the fourth bullet point. And I think that's very useful. And if anyone is gonna give feedback on this guide, I would ask them to have a particular look at that bullet point and see if you can make any suggestions for how we can make it stronger. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I G at C O E dot I N T if you want some comments by four fifty India Golf at C Charlie Orange Echo dot I Indigo Nathaniel Timothy uh, before or by the fiftieth of November. Um I I'd like we're in the last minutes of this session and we over we started late I think we can run for fifty five minutes over. Um, if you have any comments to, to Dixie, I mean, you know, the freedom of expression part was very, uh, spent a lot of time on that part. It's hard to, to, you know, fairly treat the contours of freedom of expression and to try to give users information and awareness about what they can do, what they may not, you know, there might be certain restrictions, etc. It's a very, um, it's very challenging to put it in simple, simple words with, uh, and we really try to try to hard to stay away from the legal speak as well. Um, if there are no comments on that, I think I'd like to pass it to the say if you want to back on because Matt is in the East one in December and he'll be receiving stuff from the other member states to, to look at it based on the comments received, etc. And, and uh, you know, it's part of the next steps in the process. Thank you, Lee. Um, I, 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 I like very much what Nick has just said. I think it's important that in certain Stage, you have to make a decision that you say you have something on paper. And if you have something on paper, this doesn't mean that the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story. If you have something black and white and the additional value, I think, of this document, because you were asking what this uh, additional value is, that for the first time, um, because you know, if user internet user rights attempts to have them in one instrument, this is not new. This was done by also uh, in a multi-stakeholder approach in, in, in various ways. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, as far as I know, you have the Internet Rights Charter, you have by ACP, and so on. So there are, but here, this will be really the first time that 47 governments would show their readiness as a political commitment. Yes, we want that the users understand their rights. First of all, of course, we are, of course, bound by these rights. What is clear, it goes without saying, because they are all bound to the European Camp Convention, even, right? But to give a political commitment, we want directly address you. And this is the, the, the important thing. And of course, we are careful, of course, careful, but that's what you can say in any Council of Europe, uh, Council of Europe instrument. As soon as Let's say we have an instrument supported by member states. It's not that um, you can say, well, it's soft law or uh, whatever. It is an instrument especially for the people. And that's what I wish, what, for example, journalists or human rights activists often would use much more towards the governments. That they say, look, your government, and we could take a lot of recommendations, declarations from the Council of Europe, um, that they go with them to their government and say, you have committed yourself to that, so now explain it to me, why did you commit? And then it will be quite hard, let's say, for a relevant authority or ministry or so to say, no, no, I didn't mean it like that. So this is one of the, I, I say, political implications which are very important that we have for the first time um, or will have an instrument uh, which says, okay, we have started now an ongoing process to make um, the direct effect for users uh, more, not only, not only, let's say, obvious, but also really applicable in the way that they find orientation. It's also a, a, an instrument that shows the, um, 
how shall we say, especially in the in the context of of, 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 of the remedies, uh, we all know it's a kind of, 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 of corporate social responsibility, and and we know very well it's it's the companies, it's it's the authorities with best practices maybe from the public authorities, um, but it's also let's say all our friends from the various organizations um, who really also have a common responsibility. Um, so, I think the process, I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, there will be some more weeks of intensive work, I think, I don't know how the group works now, online or so, if they have not heard a meeting, but I know they're in close contact. I think they all need the input from everybody who is, um, the great advantage of the Council of Europe is, this is a really, uh, I think, very, very high quality mixture of people. Called yourself the mother of data protection, so I think you you can bring in really a lot of experience what to explain to people what they should know about their their rights. So um, this will be then a decision of the co committee of ministers. Um, I think in the early stage of 2014 we will see if it works like that. Um, but um, I'm I'm quite optimistic, and uh, I think now it's on all of us who are interested in it to make best use of it and then finally to see it as a living instrument which uh, is under under permanent uh, maybe revision. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, so the consultation is still open. I'd like, again, I invite your comments. Um, there will be access to the explanatory around the draft, so you will have that. We we, um, we want to just focus on the draft guide because it's too much information would, would, would be too confusing. We want to make it simple and clear. That's why that, that's why we did it like this in this step. But there will be a chance to have that information and to comment. And uh, please do comment. Um, Matt is right. It's open to periodic periodic review once adopted. I hope. Um, and I hope really very much hope that we can come back next year uh, and look together again at the perhaps the final guide for the moment and to talk about that that's where it lies. If we can create something, perhaps just beginning in Europe, uh, it, it might have a lot of resonance and, 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 and positive uh, change elsewhere. Um, I still don't believe, I still believe that in terms of internet governance forum and, and discussions, we never really, really fully, fully talk with and to the users about what they understand and what they can do. Um, there's an assumption that users are users and they, they cannot, cannot do things, but it gets, there's, it's layered and it's very complex sometimes. And I, this is trying to, try to bring back information, some understanding to the user. And I'm really proud of this document and I really hope that we can uh, bring it back to you and that we can keep on making it, revising it, keep it going. Um, we have to wrap up unless it's urgent. Uh, How can one make comments? Please send your comments to uh, ig at coe. Go, golf, and Charlie, orange. I, I, and I, indigo, with annual activity. Is this document? Can we? Is this open for comp? Like, can we use it in class? Can we send? Can I take it to my senior management, or not? You can. It's a, it's a draft text. Okay, so we can actually start. You know, I would like to get feedback it's on. It's open I consultation. Can even open see consultation. Work. Okay, good. Um, thank you for your time. I'm, I apologize for running, running slightly over. Um, um, I really hope uh, we, speak, we can meet again and we can carry on discussing this. Thank you for your time.